we just want to briefly go over the vacuum restriction that we did last week. Uh, I promise that we would have done the practice, but in fact, I've tried several times. The cap actually is not able to hold onto the head of the dummy, the baby dummy that we have. And so forgive me. However, I believe that all of us have had an experience or been able to see how vacuum is actually carried out. And maybe, uh, I don't know whether you can see it very clearly, how the vacuum expression carried out and pulled for this baby to come out. In fact, This is the apparatus that is used. In fact, this is actually made for smaller facilities that, let me use that word, smaller facilities. The bigger facilities, they have big suction machine, which they use at the theaters and then they use at the labor rooms. You can even use that machine to uh, carry out suction when they want to suction the clients. They use that machine. But this one is very small, but then it can operate as uh, we desire the procedure to be carried out. And so, this is the apparatus. And then we have the cap. And so this is the silicone type. And then we have the metal cap. Let me bring the metal one. Here. So we have the metal cap also. And the sizes, we have the smaller one, the medium, and then the bigger one, which is used to fix the the tube, which will create the pressure to be used. Um, and so, and then this is the pump which you need to uh, use to bring out the pressure. So the pressure, this is the pressure gauge, which is attached to the, uh, how do I even put it? The container, the plastic container to give the pressure and so what is that is when you are testing it, you apply it to your palm and then another person will be. So you need always need an assistant to be pushing. So it goes this way. You will put the cap in your palm and then this one has to sit on the Floor, and so somebody will be pushing in and out to exert the pressure. When the pressure is up to about 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, you see that it will grip the palm very, very firmly. And then when you leave it, it will even hold and will not fall out. That means that the pressure exerted from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 gives enough pressure 
to be able to prove or to yeah to to be able to deliver the baby with that sustained pressure then how do the cap fall off when the head is delivered you know it's the normal way of our delivery and so when you hold onto the cap when you hold the cap with the head of the baby it goes like this and then in making sure that the no tissue is gripped by the rim of the cap. So you pull by maintaining flexion. So your pull will go downwards. And then when the larger diameter of the fetal head is uh, seen, you elevate or you lift the tube, the, the, the up, upwards. So it's like you maintain flexion using our fingers, pressing the head downwards to maintain the flexion until the larger diameter of the head is uh, seen. And then when, uh, which is known as the crowning. So when the crowning appears, you stop the maintaining of the flexion and then you extend. You extend until you are able to deliver the face of the baby. So that one, that is the job, the tube actually, the, the, the cap with the pressure applied does to bring this baby out. And so once the head is delivered, the tube is disconnected from here to release the pressure so that it will not continue to hold onto the fetal head to give any uh, complication or to cause any complication to the baby's head. So very sorry that I couldn't actually uh, do it on the dummy, but I believe that we all have seen how vacuum extraction is being done, conducted at our various facilities, at our various facilities. So uh, that is that for the Ventus, or vacuum extraction. We mentioned a lot of complications that may happen or occur to the baby and as well as to the mother. To the mother's side, if you don't give an episiotomy, she may sustain perineal injuries, perineal injuries, which may be fatal depending on the size of the baby coming out. And then to the baby, scalp injuries, uh, from the minutest, that is scratches and lacerations, she can have damage to the blood vessels, which may cause bleeding and uh, a lot. In fact, uh, these babies uh, may suffer as the uh, pressure of the cap applied onto the fetal scalp. And then she may, the fetus may also sustain caput succedaneum, which may be present at birth. Kepha hematoma may be 24 hours after delivery. And so that is uh, very, very necessary that if the baby is delivered, she is put to the uh, intensive care unit or NICU to be observed or any abnormalities, at least for 72 hours, so that any abnormalities that will be coming up will be dealt with before if the, uh, the baby will be delivered and discharged or before the mother may be discharged from the facility. Okay, and so for now, if anyone has any question to ask with regards to vacuum extraction, she can ask. If there is no question, we can move on to uh, normal and abnormal units as I last week. So I'm waiting if anyone has any question or any addition to be added to whatever we have already gone through.
We are waiting for any question answer. So that is the vacuum extraction of Ventus, vacuum of Ventus. Please, to the house, we are waiting oh, for your input. If anyone has anything to add up, we are ready to receive or any subtraction. Last week, I think somebody asked me, yes, the pressure at which we can do the pooling. Then I mentioned that when we do it, then I would. So I think I've rightly mentioned from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 or to about 0 0.8. That will give you the pressure. Which will be sustained and then be able to pull. You know, when you 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 try it in your palm, gloved hand, you realize how much the pressure is and how strong it is that will be able to pull. So 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 or up to 8. That will give you enough pressure to be able to push, pull the baby out so that we carry out all the necessary after delivery care that we give to the woman and then we give to the baby. This we are still waiting. Any question from the house? Hello, any question? Martha in your group. Is Martha there? Please, no question. No questions. All right. So we can move on to. The next. So we want to discuss around genital anomalies or congenital abnormalities and the care that we midwives would have to give to such women and their babies. And so So at our examination of a baby, as we examine the baby from head to toe, we are looking out for any abnormalities that are detected. And then we discuss around it. Then we try to find a solution to the problem that we see. We expect that all babies that are born 
or any baby that is born should be examined and then uh, come out with good results. However, it doesn't happen to every baby born because they are from different, different backgrounds, different environments, and then with different uh, makeup. So all babies born, though born, they have peculiar problem coming with them. And these uh, babies will come to us sometimes from referred from a different facility to our area. Sometimes at best, we may be able to detect and then we take an action. And so when such babies come, what are some of the things that we need to do as midwives? And so we can say that a baby may be born with a defect. A baby may be born with a defect. Or a baby may be born with a disorder in the newborn. And so, for example, this baby I'm having over here is born with a defect on the limbs, both upper and then the lower. And even if you see, look at the baby at a glance, you can see that even the neck is a swelling here. At birth, you notice there is a swelling here and the neck is tilted to one side more than to the other side. So with this baby, as we examine from head to toe, we identify a, a problem with a hand. You see this hand is opened up with no problem, but this hand is closed up. And so there is an abnormality here. Sometimes you may even see extra digits. That is more than five digits that the baby has. But then some babies who have these abnormalities, like this extra digit, is well accepted in particular families because they feel that it is their custom. And so even if you want to do something, for example, you want to tie the extra digit that is hanging, you tell them, they will tell you that, oh, wait for my husband to come. You want to see. Sometimes when the husband come in the show, then the man will say, that is uh, telling us that uh, this baby is from my family. So they will not allow you to uh, tie it from the baby's hand. And so uh, some defects are more severe than others. So I'm using just this baby for an example. And so we can see a defect over here. The neck is swelling and tilted to one side. And the hand is clamped up together. So the fingers are webbed. They are webbed together. And then you see the toes. This one cannot be straightened if you look at this baby here. The toes. You see, one limb is shorter than the other. It's not equal. So if you want to check for equality, you see that the, there is a difference. This one is a little bit splitting up, but this one is pulled backwards. So there is an abnormality at birth. So this baby is born with this defect already. And you can see that all the toes are also webbed together. Over here is a big toe that is not uh, attached to the others. There is a space, but all the rest are webbed. And so 
it goes on and on with some abnormalities that these babies may be born with. So it depends on us, the midwives, as we examine them at birth. It's very, very crucial to examine every baby who is born to us to identify any problem and then find a solution to that. So this is just an example. There are others which are more severe. For example, a baby may be born as a, a result of maybe a structural anomaly or a functional anomaly. An example of this structural uh, anomaly may be an, an encephaly, which is as a result of neural tube defect. And so that one is a developmental problem of the structure that the baby is coming with. But unfortunately, this baby ended up with this an encephaly. It's not very common, but occasionally you may come across with this. And so this anencephaly, or you may see a baby with a spinal bifida at the back here. And that means that it's a problem with the spine. And so there may be a hole over here at the spinal area when you examine. And so it's a problem affecting a problem from the spine, a problem from the spine. And so as we examine every baby, I believe that we carry it out as expected of us. All babies that come to us to rule out any abnormality. And so uh, a lot, when I'm done, you bring out your points other abnormalities that we can uh, bring it about so that we talk about it and then we try to find uh, their signs and symptoms and then find a prevention, a prevention to most of these abnormalities that our baby may have. Some, there is nothing so much we can do, others we can so that we prevent from uh, prenatally before she even gets pregnant and during pregnancy uh, what really happens and then at best how do we help these women who have uh, sustained this birth anomalies and are duty to these women in fact every woman is uh, happy to give birth to a normal functioning baby. And so when it happens that a family has a baby with a defect, it's a big blow, a very big blow to all of them. Therefore, when they, they, they come to us or when we come across them, uh, they, they, they actually need our emotional support so much so that they, they, they will be comforted. Even if it's worse, they will be comforted to find a solution to their problem. And so at this stage, can we talk, uh, bring about some of the congenital anomalies or congenital abnormalities we know of, we have seen, we have uh, handled at our clinical areas. In fact, this is a practical based thing uh, which, which most of us have come across. Even if you haven't come across, you've heard about it. So as I sit down, we are waiting for your input, waiting for your input to help us out, deal with this situation so that will help our mothers who come to us with any kind of uh, problem that we may uh, see.
Hello. Yes, ma. Aha. Uh -huh. So we are ready to hear from you, please. Ma, please clap the list. Hello, yeah, you can. Ma, please clap the list. Clap the list. Yes, that is also a common thing that really happens. How do we uh, care for this clap the list? Please, have you seen one before? Yes, sister. Uh huh. So. You can you can help us to have a solution to that problem that this baby may have. Cleft palate, and so that one is at uh, it's a developmental problem, and so at delivery, during your examination, definitely you will see. Hello, yes, yeah, somebody, somebody can come up with a solution to that problem, cleft palate, which is very common. Hello. Oh. You want the class to be very interesting. Though. Eh? Group A or B? Group A. Group A. Yes, sister. Are you there? I want yes. to hear you. Hello, my What do you do for the, the, the family of that baby? You have rightly mentioned cleft palate. Sister. Hello. Please, with those children, I think they have a um, problem with breastfeeding. Yeah. So we position them well using the uh, the pedal position or the football position, okay. or you can use pillow to support them when feeding them. Okay. Thank you. Oh, but you are not done. Continue. Sister, please let me help. You can help. Um, please, what we normally do is um, you encourage the mother huh? and then you educate the mother on the baby's condition. Okay. And then what you do is you tell them about infection prevention uh -huh. because it is there. So if uh, the least, uh, the least um, uh, thing or if the mother doesn't wash the hands while feeding the baby and everything, uh -huh. she can introduce infection. So you tell her about that. And then normally what we when we had one, what we did was um we were doing cup and spoon because baby was uh, able to swallow. Okay. We were doing cup and spoon. So we asked the mother to express the uh, milk the and then uh -huh. yes, uh -huh. and then we were feeding by cup. So we told the mother cup that spoon, eh? okay, let's please. Uh -huh. So we told the mother that um, when baby is, we asked the uh, mother to bring baby back in three months' time so that we'll go and see the surgeon. Mm -hmm. and then they will start the process of um, educating her for surgery, possible surgery. Okay. So that's what we did. 
Okay. Thank, Thank you. And you know, it's even though it's their mother, it's the entire family. They all That's get true. worried. Yes, they all get worried. So she was, she was really feeling um, shy taking the baby home. Uh -huh. Yeah. That is what initially I mentioned that they will need our emotional support. So they need a lot of counseling, the husband, the mother, the support persons who are taking care uh -huh. so that uh, it will not be like she's being rejected. It may even affect her. Uh -huh. So this is one of the that we talk to. So, we have to actually help them. And where, where I specifically can we identify the, the palate? So it's the upper floor of the mouth, eh? And so there is a space created there. there, and then there. No. Sometimes when they of the and so it depends on how, uh, also one. Also one. How also one. palette or the face is. And by the way, it's still not the buy, but I mean, she doesn't even say price. Please mute yourself. 24. Uh huh. 24. And mute yourself. Please, Sister Deborah. Please, Sister Deborah. Please. Sister Deborah. Okay. And so it tells us that. As we examine the baby, any abnormality or any anomaly that we come across, it's our duty to explain the procedure, to the, uh, explain whatever is happening to the family, the family members, so that they will accept the baby as it is, and then uh, our help will also uh, encourage them to not to reject that baby into the family, but then do their best to help the baby overcome the anomaly or the problem that they are facing. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yes, sister. Uh -huh. And please, the one that I saw the baby was having cleft lips and cleft palate at the same time. Yes, it's also another thing that you can still have the, the lip and then the palate together. And, and what but was the with this, uh -huh. Uh -huh. But with this baby, the baby was really active. The baby could suckle so well. We were even surprised that okay. the baby could suckle so well. It didn't pass but, through the um, Pardon? Did the breast milk pass through the nostrils? No. Okay. Because sometimes when they are no. feeding, no. When, when they are feeding, it passes through the and no. So they may even get aspirated along the, the line. So you observe as they feed. Continue, please. And with this, um, that was the, their first baby. And the husband was really supportive of it. Like the husband came, yes, like they wanted how they're going to manage it. And the lady wasn't shy to show off the baby. I was even surprised that most oh. often they try to hide the baby. And, but this woman was proud of the baby okay. and he got the husband support also. That is great. So fortunately, um, at uh, Techima Hospital, I learned that there were some surgeons who were about to do some some um, surgery uh -huh. for those babies having and uh -huh. Yes, so we referred them to Techima Hospital, and the so okay. the baby. I have the pictures of the baby. Like oh. right now, you can't even see. Like the, everything is closed. Oh, very nice, very nice. Yeah. 
So that is an example of that. So the cleft and the palace at the same time. So, uh, and, and somebody can also get only the uh, lip, cleft lip without the palate in addition. Okay. And so, like I said, it may be due to structural formation. So during intrauterine life, the formation of the structures, the systems and all that, there is a, a, a problem or a breakage over there. Uh -huh. Any other, we have a lot to, there are a lot that we can mention. Hello? Oh, we are listening, you, my dears. Dearies, please come up with all that you have. Hello, time is going, time is moving. Hello, Benedicta. I'll look at your names and mention names. So, Benedicta. Hello, Sister Benedicta. Hello. Hello, ma. Why are we not talking, please? So you can just look at I think this way, it can be uh, infections, it can be genetics, it can be environmental factors. So either of them, you may have some defects from these areas. So please come up and let's see structural uh, form uh, formations. Any other area that you pick, you may get at least one or two from that side. Ma, that is congenital heart defects. Heart defects, yes. Uh -huh. So what happens? What happens to the... What happens to the baby? Anybody from the house? Anybody from the house? Um, Ma. Hello. Ma, please, I think baby will be signosed. That is a sign. Sinosis yeah. yes, is part of it. Uh -huh. yeah. What again? Um, difficulty in breathing. Difficulty in breathing. Uh -huh. yeah. And 
and, and baby will be lethargic too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So congenital heart defects, specifically, specifically this baby may have a hole in the heart. So we already know the fetal circulation. We are not going there, but there is a problem over there. And so this baby, what happens to the baby? What is our duty as a midwife after examining this baby at birth? Can you see it at birth or later in life? So, now I think you can have a clue to that when you monitor the vitals. Yeah. Vital signs of the baby, uh -huh. like the heart rate and the respiration, yeah. yes. and also like what my sister said, the cyanosis. Uh -huh. So this baby can be okay, with, but within some minutes you see the baby turning bluish. Uh -huh. So all this can give you a clue that your of... further investigations can be done to rule out uh -huh. the whole in that other okay. effects. So we realize the importance of examining every baby that comes into our hands. Uh -huh. Not in a rushy way, but taking our time to examine the baby from the head to toe. That's the more reason why, you know, at first, we examine the baby at the labor room and at the postnatal room too. Before the woman is discharged home, if she delivers continuously without any uh, problem, we take the baby, we examine the baby at the lying ward before she is discharged home. I believe that is what goes on now in all our facilities. Oh? Yes, ma. Uh -huh. So that even if it wasn't detected as early as birth immediately, it could be detected at least 24 hours before the woman goes home. If there is any abnormality somewhere, can easily identify. And then we take action as early as possible. And so at this stage, whenever we realize these things, so our support, like I, I initially mentioned, emotional support is very keen to the woman and the entire family, the husband, and the support person who is uh, helping with their care so that they'll be able to cope for the time being until maybe at the right time, a surgery baby done for this baby. Uh, if it needs the referral immediately, it is done. is done so that from there they will carry out uh, all the necessary investigations. Uh -huh. Any other? Ma Felicia. Hello. Please, so sorry. My network took me off. That's why I couldn't answer the rest. Okay. Uh, okay. So I was, I talked about the, uh, the heart defects. Yes. Yeah. So most in my facility, because of this condition, you see that these babies will turn blue and they will not be responding to any respiratory, um, like no matter how um, best you bag these babies, they will never respond. So in this case, you have to take um, x-ray to find out what is happening. Mm -hmm. And normally we refer them to cats. We don't nurse them here because it's a cardiac condition. Okay. So it needs a specialist attention. That is great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other? Oh, Felicia. Hello. Please, we have an um, imperfect timing. Imperfect timing. 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 Oh, yes. timing. Uh -huh. So what happens to that? And is it as a result of 
drugs, nutrition, environment, hormones, or what? Imperfect hymen. Hello, what do we do to such hello with the, with the management the one that i saw i only encourage the woman mm -hmm. and her that um the doctors to take care of it so she should not be afraid and we referred her to i think Sintress. yes so uh, what happened there we don't know okay you know it, it's very interesting sometimes when you refer a case to maybe uh, a, a different facility. Can't we liaise with them and then find uh, find out what happened to that uh, baby? Even if it's not a baby, it's a, a, a pregnant woman or any other person. So that when you are talking about it, you have an evidence that yes, we sent a client to Companoche. At the end of it all, this baby had a surgery done and then the outcome was good and all that. I think maybe we can start uh, with this from somewhere so that uh, uh, all that we are learning, we are studying uh, the the gains that we are having from the practices and the rest would advance. That is what I, I, I want to say, would advance and then it will help us in future. So we have been doing a lot of research, research process. Sometimes you may, after, after your graduation, you can even up to uh, be a, 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 a midwife researcher and then you research into some of these things and to find out so eventually you become a great woman in future. So let's uh, begin to have interest in some of these things and then work at it and see how it will benefit uh, the next generation. Any other, we have plenty of Oh, please, can we uh, add a spinal bifida? Spinal bifida, of course. Mm -hmm. It's an anomaly, severe one. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then please know about hypospadia. Hypospadia, yes. I told you there are a lot of. And it's they hypospadia. Are... Then genetic malformations like the Down syndrome. Down syndrome. It's from high the pyloric stenosis. Oh, okay. You see? Oh, you have a lot of apples. So bring them up. Pyloric uh, stenosis, yes. What yes. happened? Oh, so happened? Yeah, Atresia. Atresia. Okay, let's pick it from there. What happens to this baby with osophageal atresia? So this one we will say is a structural defect, a defect at the esophagus. Uh -huh. And so what happens to this baby with this type of anomaly? And can it be seen at birth or late, later in life? Later in life. Later in life. What happens? Some of the signs that you see. Uh -huh. Projector vomiting, like the, the baby will be throwing up, like what you throw, like, like it's, like it's called projector Projectile vomiting. vomiting. Yes. That is the commonest sign that we see with babies with this condition. 
what is our duty as a midwife? When she then she will come to you. Please, madam, my baby will not take anything. Anything that enters into the mouth, you throw it out. And so one of the major signs that you see, and what again, this baby will be losing weight. Mm -hmm. Failure to thrive. Yeah, failure to thrive. Because nothing is getting inside. All the nutrients that will get inside, it's not able to enter, penetrate. So it just accumulates into the mouth and this baby, will, it will be rejected. And so what is the way forward or what is actually done for this particular baby? Mm -hmm. So this one is surgical treatment. Surgical treatment. Be able to correct it so that it's, it's an emergency. Yeah. But sometimes they are breathing and other things are affected. The baby yeah. can get choked when feeding. Uh -huh. So they need to correct it so that the further damages not... do not affect the lungs. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So such babies are immediately referred to see the pediatric surgeon and all the necessary preparations are begun. Uh -huh. And so on our part, our encouragement uh, to the family, communicating or interacting with them to alleviate all anxiety. In fact, they become so much anxious about the situation of their babies. It's not a small thing. It's not a small thing. So please, it's our duty to help these women out. And like I said, if we refer we should take interest uh, with the outcome of whatever uh, goes on or whatever went on with this baby. Somebody mentioned hypospadia. Hypospadia, then we add epispadia. What happens? Hello, hello. Vivian Apia, Vivian. Yes, ma. Uh huh. What happens with uh, epispadia? Uh, ma, please, this one. There is no nothing you can do because there is poor at the upper part of the urethral orifice. And so there is nothing we can do. Yes, the, you can't correct it. Are you sure? Epis and uh, hypo and epis. And so when a uh, baby is born with this particular problem, either epispadia, hypos. So which one is the upper part and which one is the opening below and the up? Which one? Hypos is under, epis is up. And so at our examination, we view this problem. There is no central opening of the penis. So what is done is we have to educate the women to delay circumcision. Are we getting the point? Because the, the, the surgeons will use the prepuce or the foreskin to do skin grafting to correct the, the, the problem. And so when you examine, please pull the prepuce backwards and view the central point of the penis to see if there is an opening. If it is not there, it means that it is under or up. When you are able to identify, then you refer. When they do circumcision, that is where the problem comes. Because the, you know the, the, the foreskin is very uh, soft and because it is on the penis, 
it can easily adjust. When any other part of the skin is used to correct this problem, it takes, <laughs> if you are not lucky, it may not even never, never hold. And so eventually what could be done may be suprapubic catheterization for the rest of your life. And for that matter, please, let's take care of babies born with this particular problem to educate them against circumcision, early circumcision, one week circumcision. No, it should be delayed. And then the doctors will take care to use the prepuce to correct the pinhole. In fact, if you don't take care, you may not even see this like a pinhole. And so when they are urinating, you see the urine dripping from either below or from up. The diaper will be soaked, but if you open it, you see no urine coming from the central part of the penis. And so when you take your time, put the diaper up and above. By the time uh, you set, you realize that when you take the diaper, you see that it's soaked. That tells you that either the upper part is soaked or the lower part. That tells you that the opening is either at the upper part or below the penis. And then that is where you will emphasize your education against early circumcision. So that something better can be done for this baby. I've seen a lot of babies who had this problem and it could be corrected because uh, the education went well, circumcision was delayed, and eventually it was able to be corrected with the first thing of the penis. The one who, uh, who had a problem with uh, early circumcision, his actually, I don't know the state up to now, but there was a problem with the grafting, the skin grafting. It couldn't hold. And so eventually, because you know the acidic nature of urine actually finds its way to uh, infect the area and then the skin that is attached to that area will go off. Especially when they pass the catheter, they have a very tiny catheter, they pass, and then they leave it in situ for about a week. Then after that, they remove the catheter to see if the, that means that the, uh, they would di redirect the opening to the center. So it will be dilated, to be dilated, and then a catheter will be placed inside. By the end, when a catheter is removed, the urine, as it passes through the central part, you see that some of it will still go through that pinhole there and get that place infected, and then the skin will be off. And so that is how it is carried out with babies with uh, epispadia or hypospadia. As an abnormality, identified on the neonates. Any other? Somebody mentioned Down syndrome. Down syndrome. What do we do? Down syndrome. Is there anything we can do to help? How do we manage Down syndrome? First of all, we educate the uh, family. Yeah. And we encourage them on the care. Mm -hmm. They will give to the baby. Yeah. And then we support them. We support them. It's not a simple matter. But then to cope with whatever baby they have with that situation is is a, a long term. So the baby grows up to become matured, this condition stays. And so 
as a genetic condition, uh, it has to do with a lot of management, education, proper care given to them. All right. Another point. Hello. Hi. Uh -huh. Any other pet defect that we can talk of? And then carefully we've mentioned, do we have microcephaly? Microcephaly. Or does it refer to the same as anencephaly? It may have a source the same, but with different uh, different appearances. Different appearances. Okay, so all the bed defects actually have their signs that we see, and then some that the parents will complain becomes a symptom, and then the way forward is how to manage and then care for them as a family, as a family uh, supporting a particular person with this syndrome. Okay. So, Hello, Ma. Hello. Ma, please, we have exam follows. Exam follows. Have you seen one before? Yes, yes, ma. Aha. Uh -huh. so, okay, so yeah. as far as where what really happens? On the abdomen, the this in the what's the name? The umbilical cord side. Mm -hmm. Or it's usually okay on the abdomen. Yeah. Which sometimes you see is like the intestines is trying to protrude. We uh, have the occult one. Aha. Uh -huh. And then we have the yeah. revealed one. The revealed one. Yeah. Okay. So you see it's more or less like the intestines could be protruding out. Mm -hmm. And it's basically done by a, a surgical procedure. Yeah. So that one mostly you educate the mother on infection prevention. Infection prevention. Okay. Infection prevention. Okay. Yeah. Because the possibility of getting infected is very high. Yeah. So that one you only see the viscera covering the the intestines. Yeah. And so this uh, visibly you can see it moving up and down. Uh -huh. And so it actually takes, uh, I think it's uh, like we rarely mentioned, it's a surgical intervention that can correct this situation, of course. And so some of these uh, problems can be identified. Hello, Dufie, your hand is up. Hello. Hello, Dufie. Hello, sister. Uh -huh. Your yes. hand is up. Sister, please, I, I had wanted you to emphasize on the epispadia and the hypospadia. The care. How how you can differentiate between the two. Differentiate. Uh -huh. yes, please. You know, normally the urethra, the opening is situated at the center of the penis. But occasionally you may find it under the penis or on top of the penis. So the epispadia is the one on top, then the hypospadia is the one below. And so that is the difference. So the opening, said, so it means that the central opening of the penis is occluded. So there is no opening over there. And so 
and try to find a way, and that is a structural defect, a structural defect. And so that is how, when you examine, I said that when you examine the penis, try to pull or push the prepuce backwards, the prepuce or the false key. Fold it like this and push it from the tip of the penis backwards like this. This can you see? You hold, for example, if this is the penis, so you hold from the tip of the penis and push or pull it backwards like this. And then you examine the, the penis itself. And that is where you may see if the opening is not at the tip. So you hold the tip of the penis and then you pass to find the hole. If there is no hole there, it may be up. Or it is like a pinhole. Please, can you get me? Yes, yes ma'am. It's like a pinhole. Uh -huh. And so you can see it either at the, uh, at the, uh, under the penis or above the penis or on top of the penis. I'm saying that if you want to identify this problem, you can put a diaper at the top. Maybe the woman will come to you that my baby is not urinating since they were discharged home. Then examine the baby again. Then try to put uh, try to put a diaper fold it above the penis and then another one under and then let the penis rest for some time from 30 minutes to about an hour and see if either the top one the uh, bottom one will get soaked so the urine will be leaking will be leaking from the point of the opening uh, are we getting it and so that will tell you that the urine is from the bottom or from the top. If you don't, in fact, if you don't do the prepuce backwards, you will not view it. You can't see it. You cannot see it. And so that is when then you educate the woman that, yes, your baby is urinating, but the urine is coming from below or at the bottom of the pe uh, penis. Or on top of the penis, not from the central point. And so you educate the woman, you can you let the, the woman bring the husband and the support person to educate both, to understand the need not to do circumcision at an early uh, age at seven days, or let's say, yeah, seven days thereabouts. And then you will refer to see the pediatric surgeon. Now, when you see, when they see the pediatric surgeon, the surgeon will also talk about the same thing, not to circumcise the baby. And they will be monitoring until the time that they bring this baby. And then what they do is that they will dilate. They will open up and then they will dilate with a dilator, small, they have very tiny, tiny ones for babies. They will dilate it and then they will try to pass a catheter. Now, if you pass a catheter and urine begins to drain, they are successful. Then they will do the fluorescence at the, uh, where the point is, where the hole is. It's like a pinhole, very, very tiny. They will cut some of the purples and the, uh, the false skin. They will use it as a, a skin graft. Everything is at school. There is no leakage at where the surgery was done. Then the doctor will do the circumcision himself or herself for the baby. Please, have I explained myself? 
Yes, sister. Yes, sister. All right. All right. So I'm saying that some of these congenital abnormalities from zero to 13 weeks, when the early scan is done, that is where some of these abnormalities are identified. And then at the second trimester, they also have a scan to identify congenital anomalies, an anomaly scan. They do it at that stage to also identify any problem with the baby. Um, and so that is how it is done. So if it is identified and then uh, the doctors feel that maybe, for example, and an encephaly that is from a neural tube defect, which they feel that it may uh, cause them. this baby may not even survive. Sometimes during uh, the first week, before maybe 12 weeks or thereabouts, before 16 weeks, she may even abort. So some of the abortions are sometimes due to some of these anomalies which uh, may come out on their own. Sometimes the doctors may also uh, propose an abortion for the women. Uh -huh. I know a certain lady after marriage, I think two or three years, no pregnancy. So her pregnancy, she had this anomaly of uh, an encephalus. And so the doctors, the specialist told her that this is the situation. So they are proposing that they will admit that then they will do uh, an abortion for the woman. She, the husband and the wife couldn't uh, stand it. They wouldn't agree their first baby and all that. So the doctor allowed her to move on until uh, she delivered spontaneously. And now when she saw and the husband saw that baby, huh, it was like a hell. So after that, they had another baby, normal baby without any problem. And so these are some of the things that we may identify and then take what are some of the preventive measures we can Hello? Hello? We've seen uh -huh. that some of these causes are environmental, genetic uh -huh. infections, and sometimes drugs and radiations. Okay. So preconception care is very essential. Sure one needs to go through the preconception care mm -hmm. so that you'll be prepared towards your pregnancy. Okay. Put on, okay. put on. Folic acids, mm -hmm. diets, and also if there are any infections, they will be treated before you even get pregnant. Yes. And also sometimes depending on your, 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 your job, what you do, mm -hmm. you come to know that radiations and other things can also affect the developmental stages of the babies when they are growing up in YouTube. So when we get to know their jobs, we can counsel them, get to know how they can protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So all this can be done. And also during pregnancy, we can still be educating them because some, some of our pregnant women tend to take drugs, some prescribed drugs, yeah. and also follow through with advices from home. We can be talking, talk, talk through with them about all those things to prevent those abnormalities. Okay. Thank you very much for your supply. So I think what you said answered all uh, uh, this thing. questions. Any other, any other addition? Any problem? Uh, any support? Any? Uh, any other? Yeah. The police addition. 
-huh. When they conceive, so you have to encourage them to take their folic acid daily. Okay. So what, what is uh, the function of folic acid? Pharmacology of <laughs> Function of folic acid. Functions of we've been giving it to the women a lot, encouraging them to take their drugs. All right, I just want to uh, know a few or uh, just one function of folic acid. Hello. Function of folic acid. Hello. My, it's prevent this new out tube defects. It does what? It prevents the neural tube defects you we mentioned yeah, about, yeah, like the yeah. spinal bifida. Yeah, and encephaly. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh. What against like? them? It prevents them from getting this. Uh huh. And, and so another one. So folic acid actually works on the red blood cells. So it helps the red blood cells to be very active and, uh, uh, you know, red blood cells life span is 120 days. So within the 120 days, before it reaches the 120 days, most of the red blood cells might have, uh, been damaged or died off. And so the intake of the folic acid replenishes the red blood cells to be uh, more active and then help with the supply of oxygen and blood supply to the fetus. And so with this, it goes a long way to prevent the baby from acquiring these defects, neural effects, the neural tube defects, and then carefully and all that, spinal bifida, yes. And so folic acid is very, very important for our pregnant women. Like our sister mentioned, even before prenatal, prenatally, she can start taking the folic acid, then during pregnancy, she will still have to, still to take it until delivery. So delivery. So it's important. One of the drugs that is important for our women is this folic acid, which we have to hammer and then help these women to be taking them consistently. Thank you for your supply. Any other? Any other? Sister. Hello. And um, please, uh, with the folic acid, um, um, someone told me that um, pregnant men only needs like 0 0.4, 0 0.4 four milligram. Mm -hmm. But what we have in the hospital is five milligram. Isn't it going to have effect on us? Oh, I, I just want to understand why are we giving overdose? Is it overdose or giving five milligrams is normal? Five milligrams and the actual dose should be what? 0 0.4. That's what I heard. <laughs> this five milligrams from long, long, long time, I have seen. Five milligrams being given to all 
all women who are pregnant. So I, I have no idea about the 0 0.4 that you are talking about. Have you checked out to find out? Um, someone told me that it's because the manufacturers they make it five uh, milligram and that's just in the market. So they have the little point four milligrams in the market. The one that is in the market is five milligram. Uh -huh. And the zero point four that the person is talking about is it readily available at the market? No. Uh -huh. So that's why I'm saying that this five milligram thing has been in the system for years, for ages. And so I have no, like you're saying, this 0 0.4 milligram, it's not uh, on the market. So in fact, I don't know that it's going to have any effect to the uh, any effect on the unborn baby. Any more? Any more? Me. Maybe there. There. Please, if you don't have any more questions, any more uh, additions, can we call it a day? Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Okay, thank you. Hello, ma. Hello, mommy. Hello. Hello. Mommy, please. My network was disturbing. Could you please summarize what you've thought today? For us, I wasn't having stable network. Maybe if you could summarize what you saw today. Now your network is stable. Yes, ma. Yes. All right. Yes, ma. All right. So today we went over the vacuum extraction we did last week. I mentioned that I couldn't do the practice, but at least I showed the uh, apparatus or the items that are used to uh, conduct the vacuum extraction or the venture extraction. So after that, today's uh, topic was Uh, support and management of babies with congenital abnormalities are due to as midwives. And so we mentioned that congenital anomalies may be structural or functional anomalies. And then during the intrauterine life in their early developmental stages or after birth, some of these abnormalities or congenital abnormalities can be seen after birth. Okay. And then we went on to identify or uh, talk about some of the abnormalities that we, we, we have seen and uh, addressed. For example, Epispadia, hypospadia, uh, Down syndrome, 
cleft lip, cleft lip, and then cleft palate or cleft palate alone. You can still have only the cleft lip or only the uh, cleft palate, and you can have both cleft lip and cleft palate. And so some of these, like the cleft palate and the uh, lip, their management is to have surgery done. And so it's important to do, carry out examination of the newborn to identify some of these things and then refer as early as possible. With the hypo, hypospadia and then epispadia, we identify that the urethra may not be at the central point of the penis. And so during the examination, you have to pull the prepuce or the foreskin backwards to observe. The mother may come to you that the baby says they went to, the baby has not urinated. For all you know, there is leakage of urine, but the mother has not identified. And so, or the midwife couldn't identify as early as possible and the woman went to me she, she, she came back with that problem. And when we identify, all that we do is to uh, delay, educate the parents, the family to delay circumcision so that the surgeon may use the foreskin or the prepuce to do skin grafting for the baby. And so that is to the epispadia and then the hypospadia. The epis is up, the hypos is down. And so that is for the correction of that. With the Down syndrome, we mentioned that uh, that one, not much can be done because it is a genetic problem. And so we have to educate the family so that they can they will cope with the problem as it stands. And so that is how it goes. Uh, with neural tube defects that may uh, cause spina bifida or anencephaly, it can be detected through early scan. And so the management may start with the doctor from the beginning until the time that uh, the whole problem is solved. With the cleft palate, cleft leg, surgery is done. To, but then some of the babies with this issue may have swallowing, uh, uh, eating problem, or sometimes this baby can even handle their breast and they can have uh, their breast milk as it is. Then we can also have an abnormality known as the esophageal atresia, where the, there is a swallowing problem. And so with this one, the, sign, the major sign that is seen is projectile vomiting. So with this, and then uh, this baby will have uh, difficulty in growing up or thriving will be very, very slow. This one to the end of it all is surgery that has to be done for this baby and many other. And so you can go through we also had an, an uh, exomphalos, which has the whole abdominal covering, abdominal skin is off. You can only see the viscera hanging there. You can see the intestines moving. So these are some of the things that we mentioned. And then the prevention is from, you know, the causes, uh, some are from the environment, from drugs, from infections and then from uh, genetic factors. So you treat according to the cause. So you identify the cause, you treat it. And then we realize that folic acid is one 
basic drug that actually help the women to prevent some of these congenital abnormalities, for example, uh, neural tube defects. And so we have to encourage our women to take folic acid even prenatally before they conceive. And then during pregnancy, they should continue to take their uh, folic acid. So basically, this is a summary of all that we did. Are you okay with that? The one who asked. Yes, ma. Thank you very much, ma. So I'm, I'm so grateful. Okay. So we are done for today. We'll continue next week. You see, please. You send this video.